Hello, and welcome to another episode. Today, I want to take you through the procedures that I use to set up my quizzes and exams. This will be a little bit more technical than what I normally do, but what I would like to do is take you through the overall decisions that I made on how I wanted to organize the quizzes and exams, and then show you how I made that technically happen in Canvas. If you use another learning management system, I'm sure that there's probably some similar ways to do this, but you may have to find other workarounds for the particular system that you use. So what I'm showing you here is the different types of quizzes that I have in my course. Essentially, I have three different kinds of quizzes. And then, of course, I have my regular exams. There's only one of the first type of quiz, and that is in my syllabus quiz. And with the syllabus quiz, this is a quiz that I have in the very first module of the course as part of the way that students are just getting set up in the course and understanding all the things that are happening in the course. And so what I do with the syllabus quiz is I give them unlimited opportunities to take the quiz. They can take the quiz as many times as they'd like. It actually tells them what the right answers are after they, if they want to review the quiz after they take it the first time. And they are told that they have to have at least 80% on that quiz before they can move on into the regular course material. So this syllabus quiz is really designed to get them to read the syllabus. It is to help them just get used to the quizzing tool itself and is meant to, to really just be practice. It's, it's not set up to be something that I'm, I'm really trying to grade them on, but it's, it's more of just an experience to get them into the course, get them started, make sure that they've looked at the syllabus. So there's only one of that type of quiz where they can just take it unlimited times and, and get the highest grade. The, the next type of quiz that you can see on the list are reading quizzes. Anytime that I have the students doing any type of reading before class, whether it's textbook reading or um, website reading, anything like that, they are told that they will have a reading quiz over whatever the reading is. Reading quizzes are set up to help them kind of think about the types of materials that are coming up in the topic in the module. So, they're relatively low stakes. They're again, more of a way of getting the students to interact with the material, getting them to know that there's a deadline to have that done so that they can get into the module itself. And with the reading quizzes, what I've done is those have five questions in them. Uh, they actually come from a pool where there's a larger number of questions. And that varies depending on the quiz and how many questions I was able to, to put together for that particular module. But what, what, the, what the reading quizzes do is they are set up so that students can get a good grade on it. The, the idea is again, I, it's not supposed to be something that penalizes them, but actually helps them prepare and to practice. And so they're allowed to take the reading quiz three times and I will take the highest grade. But because I want them to really be thinking about the material, I don't tell them what the right or wrong answers were after each attempt. They take the attempt and they get a score. So it requires then that they do a little bit of thinking about it, some metacognition, where they need to think about, you know, which of those questions that they remember taking were questions that they felt confident that they had gotten the answer from the reading, or which ones were they not so confident in? And in the ideal situation, the students would then use that to maybe go back and review the reading to think about that a little bit more before taking the quiz again. So it's, it's meant to be a little bit reflective, but still have a chance to get a good grade. Now, they're not going to see exactly the same questions every time. So I do strongly recommend that they take all three attempts, even if they get a perfect score the first time, so that they see what those other questions are gonna be, because those are again topics that may show up in the module, but they also may show up in exam questions later on. So reading quizzes come before they do the module. They do have to complete at least one attempt of the reading quiz before they can see the rest of the module. And there's a reading quiz for 
about probably 80% of the modules in the course. Not every module has reading associated with it. Some modules cover the same reading, just different parts of it than a previous module. So I don't have them do a, a reading quiz for every module, but the vast majority of the modules have a reading quiz before them. And so to set those up, just to show you, um, like I said, I was going to show you the, some of the technical details of this. If, if we look at just the settings in Canvas, and that's the learning management system I use, um, your management system may have similar but slightly different uh, ways of doing these things. But I've, I've got with um, each, each reading quiz has essentially the same instructions at the beginning that remind them that they will only get one shot at each question. They can't, they can't go back and, and look at questions after they've finished answering them. So they must go through the, the, the module or the reading quiz in sequence, watching, looking at each question, answering it, and then moving to the next. They can't go back. And, the, uh, and then explains in the directions that they can get up to three attempts and the highest grade counts. And all those attempts have to be completed before the module deadline or they start to lose points because I have a late point deduction policy in the course as well. Now, technically, I will go ahead and say there's one issue with the late policy is that if somebody gets their high grade early and then takes another quiz later, it does apply the late policy to all the grades. So I do have to go back and manually uh, remove the late policy from people who actually have their high grade before. And I just tell my students to, to, to tell me that that's uh, happened and I can fix it for them. Because I do tell them I want them to use all three attempts. So maybe while they're studying for the exam, they go back and take another attempt. And that's going to be well after the deadline for the module in most cases. So I fix that manually. That's the only quirk that, that I've found so far with this particular setup. But so I've got each, each in these uh, quizzes, each question is worth 0.75 points. I explained that in a previous video. The um, answers are shuffled between attempts. So if they do get the same question, the answer is not going to be in the same order. The questions are actually coming from a pool, so they're not necessarily going to get the same five questions either, and I have the questions grouped by topics. So if I'm going to ask a question, for example, I'm going to be asking about um, cell walls and bacteria, I'm going to have a section in that that may be about the cell wall types, and another, and there may be two or three questions or more that get pulled into the quiz from that, and then I have another section that asks about the cell wall materials, what, what you know, types of, of polysaccharides are in the cell walls. That's going to be another subset of questions that we've drawn from. So I know they're going to get a question about cell wall material. They're going to get a question about cell wall type, even though they're, I don't know exactly which question that each student's going to get each time. So I, I do set the, the, that up into groups so that I know what type of question they'll get so they get the whole set. If you put them all in one giant pool, they might get two questions on the same exact topic. So you do have to sub, subdivide it a little bit that way. I, I do have it set up for multiple attempts. Uh, the, the, the sort of rule of thumb I've been using in my courses right now is one minute per question. So it's a five qu question quiz, I give them five minutes. The quiz has multiple attempts and in this case it's set to three. And it's set to give them the highest score. So it doesn't matter whether it's the first or the last score, whatever the highest is, that's the grade that they're gonna keep in the grade book. I do have it set as re view responses, no, so that they can't see what their actual answers were, they just get a score. And like I said a moment ago, this requires them to think a little bit about whether they're positive on certain answers or not. And then one question at a time where they cannot revisit any question. So they get a question, they answer it, they move on to the next one, they can't go back. That's uh, partially done, uh, and you'll see that in my other uh, quizzes and exams. Um, it's, it's partially done because it's, it's sort of one of the anti-cheating uh, things that I try to use and give them a lot of time to, to go back and look up an answer on another, on a previous question. Um, and it, it also allows me to not worry as much about whether a later question in a question uh, in a quiz is going to answer a previous question, which limits sometimes the kinds of questions that you can ask. So there's a couple of reasons why I do the, the uh, not going back on, on questions on these. Then um, 
there's several options on here relating to test security on the quizzes. I don't use any test security as far as they're not required to lock down or anything like that. Um, but it, this is designed to be a lower stakes quiz. So uh, that's one of the reasons why I don't think that that's necessary to, to add that, that burden of all these extra technical issues that come along with things like locking down browsers and other things. So um, that is the basic setup for a reading quiz, which they get multiple attempts, low stakes, and they get the highest grade out of those attempts. The other type of quiz that I have in the course are summary quizzes. So if we come down here as a module two summary quiz, module three summary quiz, the summary quizzes are designed to summarize what a student should have learned in a particular module once they've completed the module. So what I, what I like to do with the summary quizzes is these are a little bit higher stakes in the terms that they only get one attempt. So they can't take multiple attempts. When I set these quizzes up, the differences, um, there are now six questions, so I give them six minutes. The, the questions, again, the answers are shuffled. There are no multiple attempts, so they get the one shot. They, again, don't get their answers back. They only get a score. And they get one question at a time where the questions are locked after the answer. So the same as the reading quiz in that. I again don't use any of the lockdown type things for this. It's it's a little higher stakes than the reading quizzes because they only get the one attempt. But in the grand scheme of things, I tell the students and I try to emphasize to them that when you take these quizzes, you'll get a good idea of what you actually learned, which is going to help you understand whether you're really ready for the, the course exams or not. So you're they're hurting themselves if they're trying to cheat through these because they're not gonna be prepared for the exams, which are worth a whole lot more points. And so uh, I try to tell them, use these as learning opportunities and to help them see uh, if, they're, if they're, they're learning it. And for the most part, these, these summary quizzes are, are hitting the high points of the module. So it's, it's hitting some of the major things that they should have learned or be able uh, to do from the learning objectives for the module. And they should have a pretty good grasp on that if they've completed the module and the activities with the module as expected. So that's the three types of quizzes, essentially. The, the super low stakes re, uh, syllabus quiz at the very beginning, the moderately low stakes reading quizzes with multiple attempts, and the slightly higher stakes summary quizzes that come at the end of some of the uh, modules. And they're not at all in all the modules because I have either a summary quiz or a graded activity in the majority of the modules. So I don't typically have both. So so not, I think um, only probably less than half of the modules have a summary quiz. It may be even quite a bit less than that. Most of the modules have an activity or a summary quiz, like I said, and there's more activities than there are summary quizzes that are graded. Now, the other thing that falls under the learning management system under the term of quiz is actually course exams. And I'll, I'll show you one major difference that I did with course exams in, in, in my decision making for this, this particular course. So what I did is if you are familiar with Canvas at all, they have their regular quizzes, which is their, their older quizzing tool that they've built into the learning management system. And they have a new quizzes or quizzes next, which I think is the, the, the term, the, the official term for that, which is a newer quizzing tool that they're, they're transitioning to. And by default, I've just used the old quiz tool for, for all of my regular quizzes um, because I already had a lot of these set up in a previous uh, you know, questions that I, I had in the system and were easy to work with. So I, looked carefully at how I wanted to do exams and I made a decision about the exams that required me to use the quizzes next. And the main point that I did th that I used that for is because when I do the regular quizzing tool, I can shuffle answers on questions and I can pick questions from a question group, but I cannot change the order of question types. So 
often when I'm writing the questions, I will write the first question based on the first learning objective and the second group of questions on the second learning objective and just work my way through a section of the course that way. And so I have all these questions in that order, but I don't want them on the test in that exact order. And if I wanted to change the order from test to test, from student to student, there's no way to do that in the old quizzing tool. But the, the, the quizzes next or the new quizzes tool allows you to actually shuffle question groups. So I can, I can shuffle question groups and I can shuffle and I can pick questions from a group within that. And then I can shuffle answers in a question. So it just gives more variation to the order in which students are going to get the questions and the order of which, you know, those questions, which questions are going to be chosen from a group and what order those answers are going to be in. And that is, is my primary tool for just making it harder for students to try to cheat because they're not going to see questions in the same order as someone else, even if they were trying to take the test at the same time, um, communicating, you know, through whatever method they might use when they're not supposed to be during a test. So, so that was the decision I made, which required me to use the quizzes next tool. So let me go ahead and just, I'm going to open this up so you can see what that looks like a little bit in the exam. So this is a different tool. So the, 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 the tool is set up differently and you see a different screen than you saw with the quizzes. There is still a settings area. And in the settings area, I have set shuffle the questions, which means all the question groups are going to be presented in a random order. So it's not going to be the order that I have added them to the quiz anymore or to the exam anymore. It's going to be whatever order they get randomly. So they'll get all in this particular test. I believe there were 40 different questions. It's going to get all 40 questions. They're set up in groups already. Each question group is going to be in a random order. So every student's going to get essentially a different order just from the way that the, 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 the questions are displayed in a different order. And then within that, I'm going to be picking a question, a subset of questions out of a larger group of questions on a particular topic. And, and so those are going to be in a random order and not every student in this case, in my exams, I've made the decision that not every student's going to get the same questions. So they're going to get a subset of questions from that question group. And there are issues with that. Are all the questions in my group equivalent? Probably not exactly, but fairly close. And so that's something that I will do over time with more data that I just don't have. And again, we're teaching, we're making a lot of these changes very quickly because of the situation with the pandemic. And so I know that there's probably going to be slight variations in the difficulty of questions that students get from that are pulled from those question groups. But I believe that there's enough similarity in the difficulty that overall the test similar that the test difficulty is not going to vary greatly across a student getting these random questions. So that is something I will continue to look at more carefully. I can get data. I can actually um, get a report from Canvas that tells me the difficulty of each question based on the student answers and who got it right and how many didn't get it right for any question in a, in a group that was used. And so I can look at that and use that data more in the future and see if I need to remove some questions or, or change some questions. But right now I'm, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with the fact that I think they're getting a fairly equivalent exam by, but still getting different questions. And that's a, a, a compromise I'm having to make uh, to, to limit cheating. And I do the same things that I mentioned with the quizzes. I only allow them to do one question at a time. I'm shuffling answers. So even if they get the same question, the answers are going to be in a slightly different order each time. And I have set a time limit of one hour on this particular exam. There's, like I said, there's about, there's 40 actual questions, but some of those questions have multiple parts. Um, so it really works out to approximately 50 answers if you were looking at it from, you know, a standard answer versus question type uh, uh, count. And, and I, I've compromised and went ahead and did 60 minutes instead of 50, which is what the students in a face-to-face -face setting would have gotten. Just, uh, just to give a little bit of flexibility, but not too much. I think this is sort of a reasonable thing. And what I've found so far 
um, with most of the exams I've given uh, in this setting is the average student is taking about 40 minutes. So the 60 minutes is, is giving the students who need a little bit more time, uh, that extra time, but most students are finishing well within even the 50 minute that, that I would have done in a face-to-face. -face. And that's fairly close to what I saw in a face-to-face -face setting. There's not a lot of difference in the timing of, this, of these uh, tests and the material. So I don't allow multiple attempts. The exams are once and done, right? They get one shot at that. Um, I don't show them anything other than a score. And I usually don't show them the score until some date later. So I actually have the, the, the grade book set not to show them the score until we've had a chance to, to finish grading. I have mostly multiple choice test questions. I have some true false and some matching, some fill in the blank, and there's usually one to three across my different tests that are a short answer, which is usually, in, the, in this case, a really short answer, like a, a one to two sentence kind of answer, but something where I want them to describe something or explain something or give an example of something. Those short answers have to be hand graded. Everything else will auto grade in, in, this, in, this, uh, in this quiz tool, but I, always have my graders double check fill in the blanks. The, the computers are extremely literal on fill in the blanks. So if a student, I'm, I do not count off for uh, spelling unless I tell the students that the spelling is required on a particular word. And so for that, I have the, the graders check because maybe they had a typo in a word and it's, you can tell it's the obviously the right answer, but the computer will grade it wrong. Um, it does in the quizzes next look at capitalization which is which is good in some cases because I have certain answers where I require the word to be capitalized because of the formatting that's required for organism names. So it'll catch that, but sometimes it would catch, students would capitalize a word that didn't necessarily need to be capitalized, but it didn't matter if it was capitalized and the computer was counting that as wrong. So I've tried to add those in as, as alternate correct answers, but I may not catch all those. So I have all the fill in the blanks are hand reviewed all of the short essays are hand graded. And I do also have some issues with the way this grades matching. Uh, it does not grade matching. It grades it as an all or none. It doesn't give them partial credit. So I have to have those hand reviewed by my graders as well. So those are a couple of the limitations in this, but I think using those, this tool was worth it to me because I get that sh those shuffled questions, which I think is one of the, the the best ways for me to handle students taking the, the the test at the same time in different locations and trying to limit them from trying to communicate with each other and and just make it a little simpler to to discourage cheating there are lots of other things you could do with with locking down and webcam monitoring and proctoring i chose not to do any of those i emphasize to my students a lot the, the value of honesty and integrity when they're taking their exams, that they benefit by knowing that they know or don't know the material, which is going to be, this is an entry level course that's going to build a foundation that they're gonna need in a lot of their other courses later in, the, in their, their career. So I, I try to emphasize that aspect of it and don't go heavy on the technical other than these things that I've built into the structure of the test, I don't require lockdown browsers or web proctoring. I, I feel that the more technical levels that we add, the more technical complications we add, and I don't wanna add that to the whole test taking issue. There's always enough problems as it is with internet connections and other things happening right now, but I just don't wanna add a diff, another layer or two on top of that of potential technical issues. So I chose not to use any of those and to use these other techniques that are lower tech, but appear so far to be, to, to be working relatively well for me. I have not seen large increases in my average test scores. The, the students seem to be doing similarly to previous semesters on similar material and questions. And um, it, the, the grades are a little higher, but, but not alarmingly so. And so given all the situations, I'm, I'm okay with that. And um, I think that 
this has worked well for me. And so these are some, some of the things you will have to make your own decisions about. Um, but I, I, I definitely think that it, it is also a little less adversarial to have fewer of these technical things in the way we're, we, you know, students feel like, you know, we're looking over their shoulder all the time. And I know we do that when we proctor face to face, but we rarely go and like, you know, stand and literally look over someone's shoulder during a test. We're watching and proctoring face to face in a, in a lecture hall looking for, you know, obvious signs of, of attempts at cheating. Uh, I think I, don't want to be that any more obtrusive than I have to be with the the web-based exams either. As long as I'm getting a result that that I think is fair for everybody. So that is an overview of all the technical things, and um, I I think if you use other learning management systems, I think hopefully you can you can find similar settings in in those as well to allow you to do this. It's not not every one of these settings is probably available, but you can you can look at opportunities in your own learning management system to do similar things. I hope you found this video useful and found some ideas that you can use in your own courses. As always, thank you for watching and I'll see you soon.